So welcome back to another uh, episode of Rugspirations. We have a special guest from across the country or where, from where I am across uh, uh, across the United States. Uh, Diane Tobias is joining me today from California. Um, welcome, Tobias. We, this is the first time we've actually spoken in person. I see your work a lot, but I haven't uh, gotten the opportunity to speak with you. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. So... Um, we'll just jump into the questions, but as always, uh, these are the same questions. We just never know where they'll take us, and um, and that's kind of the fun about these things. So for people that don't know you, I know I know you a little bit about what you do and the variety of rug hooking and the elements you include, but um, can you summarize who or what got you started in this journey? Like, how did it happen? The journey is an interesting one, and I love being asked because it takes me back and I kind of retravel that journey. I started um, with rug braiding, with traditional wool rug braiding. Um, I inherited through my parents four very old braided rugs that were my great aunts. Uh, she was an artist, but I don't think she braided them, but they obviously were a hand braided and probably from old clothes like they were and they were beautiful. I grew up with them and then realized when we were breaking up my parents house how much I liked them. So I took them and as they began approaching 100 years and I couldn't repair them any longer, my husband dared me to um, to learn to rug braid because I looked for hand braided rugs and um, they're very hard and very expensive to find. So I started with rug braiding. And that was very um, rewarding. And then I met Chris McDermott, who is a fantastic yes. um, rug hooker from Vermont. And she's also a braider. And we uh, met at several, uh, at that time, braid-ins. And then with another woman who um, is Christine Mangus, who is mainly a braider. She's dabbled in hooking, but um, Chris taught me how to hook. And I must say I was pretty resistant at the beginning, but now I love both. And it's very difficult to, um, to choose one over the other. Chris's, um, one of Chris's claims to fame is combining rug yeah. hooking and braiding. And so she does amazing work. And um, through one of those braid-ins, she asked Christine and I if we'd be interested in writing a book. She had been approached by a publisher and had said no. And after meeting us, um, she wondered if we would. So the three of us embarked on a kind of side journey of a couple of years, and we published a book through Schiffer. Um, it's kind of a neat coffee table book for, for our niche um, that has a lot of instructions about braiding, some about hooking, and then a lot of pictures. And um, so that got me more in, into hooking. Um, because I'm from California, it was difficult for me to bring big rugs in progress to braid-ins in my I suitcase. Imagine. So I gravitated to smaller pieces and I made a lot of baskets and um, hooked and braided combinations uh, and mats. And so in reflecting upon my journey, I think that Braiding and hooking with alternative fabrics has been a side journey that I've embarked on. So recently I braided um, with uh, jelly rolls, quilting jelly roll cotton, and another um, beautiful piece with some polished cotton that uh, a friend gave me. And so that was with all the same um, fabric and it looks like silk, a very tiny braid. So um, my claim to fame began to be the tiny braid lady oh, um, at braid ends and then alternative fabrics. And I began to, uh, at one point in time, uh, incorporate velvet into my braiding. And velvet is um, harder to find. I had dabbled a little in dyeing wool and I said, well, maybe I could dye velvet, then I could have any color I wanted. So that's been a, um, a very rewarding journey, a lot of experimentation. My velvet is stretch velvet, which I think has a lot of advantages to silk uh, and certainly cotton velvet, but they takes different dyes and it's been mm -hmm. a lot of experimentation. Um, I can't 
use it all. And so I started a business. Yeah. Um, and now I probably dye more than I hook and braid. Um, and can you so braid with stretch velvet? Yes, yes. Okay, interesting. In fact, I just braided a rug a few months ago um, and put it in a high traffic area and it's doing fine. Oh, um, some years ago, I did a hit and miss rug with some turquoise velvet for my son and daughter-in-law because they had... Um, they had painted their great room walls kind of a dark turquoise. So, uh, and it, and it's doing fine, but also mats and, and, and um, baskets. Uh, I think it's a little easier to hook with stretch velvet than it is to braid with stretch velvet. You have to uh, get the tension. Yeah, um, I imagine. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm to, a my new knowledge, if, uh, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, and I'd love to be corrected and and meet another hand dyer of stretch velvet. But to my knowledge, I'm the only one. So I would love to meet someone else and share experiences. So if there's yeah. anyone out there, please yeah. contact. Me. Reach out if you have dyed stretch velvet. Right, <laughs> I, right. I did it right. accidentally once. Well, not accidentally. I was dyeing wool and I thought, I wonder what happens if I put, and mine was just inexpensive stretch velvet. It was, I don't know where I got it, probably from a... Uh, a shirt that I'd cut up and I just popped it in the pot and it was interesting because part of it died and part of it didn't yeah. die at all right um, right so it's kind of a neat effect but certainly not something that I could replicate or <laughs> you know plan on so I've I've expanded that a little bit because I can use the same dyes on um synthetic taffeta mm. which almost looks like silk it's shiny and knobby yeah. it hooks up beautifully and also a um synthetic silk and so oh. they all three I can put in the same pot and I right. call it marrying the colors. Yeah. And sometimes you get a match and sometimes, you know, the, the fabrics take it differently, but it's always interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I love I love the excitement of dying. Um, wow. So you have had a variety of different things. Is it possible to pick a favorite? Like if you had to pick a favorite part of the process, is it planning, dying? collecting supplies, doing the rug hooking or braiding? Is there one? That you well, love? I, I guess right now I'd have to say the dyeing is the most creative. Um, I am a retired pharmacist and I thought that I only had a left brain, but <laughs> the dyeing has allowed me to be creative. And so I'm really enjoying that. Um, as far as hooking and braiding, you know, I really like both. And as you'll see from the piece I show later on, I've taken Chris's idea and a lot of my pieces are combination uh, braiding and, and hooking. I, I really think that um, they lend themselves very nicely to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I had just, or I just had the fortune of meeting Chris and taking her right. braiding workshop um, or adding a braid to a punched piece in our case, because we did it at Amy Oxford's in Vermont uh, a few months ago. Um, and yes, I'm excited to do it again, although a little nervous because it's always different when you do it in a class and you have, you know, the expert there. <laughs> so, right. Well, and it, and it, <laughs> you know, I'm always asked and I don't think there are any videos. Chris and I have taught a number of times um, and Chris even more um, at, at classes at Atha and uh, at the last Tigger I did or the next, I mean, Victoria Tigger. Right. Um it it there are some challenges to do it uh online i think especially the budding which is the last um part of the process i find um back to your question um is sometimes both braiding and hooking is like a good book i don't want it to end yes and so i find that i slow down mm. um which is strange most is, people yeah. are want to finish it up so Anyway. Well, I think that feeling though of sort of sadness or having to let go of a project, you know, when it wraps up is that's a common one that I've heard from others, but I not necessarily to slow people down, but definitely to recognize that there's a bit of a, a little bit of a sadness when we have enjoyed the hooking of a certain piece and nor the braiding and, you know, putting the finishing touches on it that uh, when it comes to an end, it's like, it's a little bittersweet. <laughs> I guess that the other part of that is sometimes if I don't have something planned in my yeah. mind for the next piece, um, then that might slow me down a bit. So, yes. Yeah. Oh, me too. 
Although that rarely happens. I My problem is usually I have 10 things I want to do and it's the picking the actual one I'm going to actually work on. <laughs> right, right, right. Or um, simultaneous. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, is there something you wish you'd learned earlier or something that you teach other sort of new hookers, new braiders about the process that you find important? You know, if I had it to do over again, I would have started with hooking yarn. Oh. It's a much more Canadian uh, art form. Uh, and I have a lot of Canadian customers for my velvet. I find you all so much more adventuresome. <laughs> Don't tell, but more <laughs> adventuresome than U.S. in terms of going beyond wool right. and using alternative fabrics. And so I have done a few pieces um, in uh in yarn, I haven't dyed the yarn because again, that would be wool. Mm -hmm. um, but I have such a stash of wool fabric that, um, you know, I, I think it, it, at my place in the journey, I don't want to increase the stash of having yarn, but I really like not only the look, but also the process of, um, of hooking yarn. I mean, as you all know, mm -hmm. you can just do a background with one skein yeah. and you never have to stop and start. Um, yeah. So I, I, I wish that um, yeah. if I were to go back to the beginning. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And it's, it totally depends on who your first teachers were, who, you know, depending on the area you are, uh, because even though in Ottawa, there's quite a few rug hookers who work only with wool strips, but the teacher that I happened to fall upon, and I was very lucky to, um, she only used yarn. <laughs> So I only oh. started with yarn and I came to wool strips after. So you just never know. Um, do you have a favorite, I mean, talking about yarn or wool, a favorite sort of foundation fabric or tool or, you know, other material that you're like, without this, it would not be the same. Well, velvet's the obvious one. Yeah. Um, and I have you know, in terms of backing, I've used really a, for hooking, I've used um, probably all of them. I, for my alternative fabrics, have liked what we call in the States panel cloth. I think it used to be called Varel. It's a yes. synthetic um, and the, the, uh, especially velvet pulls through really easily. I mean, velvet also pulls through easily through yeah. linen or, or monk's cloth, but, um, I was able, and this was from one of my teachers. She used that. One of the advantages is you don't have to do the, the complete background. You can leave some of it not hooked and then it looks a little 3d. Um, so I have been able to find a source for that. And um, so I certainly don't use that exclusively, but um, that might be a little bit different than uh, than most people. Yeah. Um, and do you do it in different colors? Because I've heard Varel comes in a variety of colors. Has that been your experience? Yeah, through, through my hooking guild, I've been able to buy at our auctions um, some different colors. And I'm even thinking, um, because now I have quite a bit, uh, maybe putting some on my website and people might try it because I am, when I when I post things and I say it's on panel cloth, um, people say, oh, yes. where can you, can you find that? When I have bought it um, wholesale, it's been from manufacturers of modular office furniture. Yes. And that's I think the that's the, the word panel cloth. Yeah. Um, and also people have said that they use it for speakers, you know, to cover oh. um, music speakers. Yep. Yep. Um, so. Oh, yeah. interesting. Well, if you do sell it, definitely let me know because I've been asked like other people that have heard about Varel anyway, that's what we would call it. Um, and I have not been able to help find that for them. I don't have any and right. um, I've not been able to find it for, for people. So um, I think it's it's harder to come by nowadays here um, than I guess it once was because there's definitely still a few hookers. I'm not sure. It. Yeah, when I hook, I prefer. Um, I'm certainly not a primitive rug hooker, and so seven is about as high as I go. Um, so I'm not sure it would work for eight, eight yeah. and a half, nine. I think it works fine for the. Um, you know, the lower and again for the taffeta and velvet and silk, yeah. but um, yeah. anyway. And definitely for yarn. The people I'm thinking of are yarn hookers and they oh, like it for, okay. for finer yarns as well. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Interesting. Interesting. Always learning. Um, and do you have a favorite tool? Like I'm wondering for working with that kind of alternate fibers, do you use a gripper frame? Do you like a hoop? What do you work with? Yeah, I've never been able to, um, to have a hook, a hoop work. Again, I think I need to meet someone who could show me. So I have a floor frame, pretty traditional. And I have um, what Chris started me off on, which is a collapsible um, portable frame. I don't think it's made any longer, Turtle Creek. And that's the one that I usually gravitate um, to. So yeah, it's just the same. Yeah. Um, you really need to uh, get it taught in order to bring the, uh, especially velvet up, yeah. but because it's stretch, um, you know, you can alter the, the, um, size of the loops or the length of the loops and, um, but getting it taught is, is the key. Yeah. Yeah. I like it taught as well. Um, can you describe what rug cooking and braiding does for you? Like, why do you keep coming back to it? Is there something particular about it that you can explain or help us understand? Well, I look at friends around um, and I wonder what they do with their days. <laughs> I mean, because I'm just so satisfied with all the different aspects that we've talked about truly. And I can't imagine not being involved in, in, you know, I guess all three aspects um, of, of um, where this journey has led me. So uh, it just gives me a fulfillment. Uh, I think the being able to die because I love doing that and then have people buy it so I can die more <laughs> is is very it's satisfying to me it's almost a um since i can't use it all because i do too much dying it it gives me a sense of um really i, I don't want to say self-worth that sounds like i'm flawed but um no but the productivity and other people um appreciating uh, what I'm doing. I think we all have that, whether we're putting our pieces in exhibits or selling them or having people admire them. That, that's certainly not the whole reason we do it, but um, it's, it's a very rewarding part of it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you mentioned that you were sort of, le you thought you were mostly left brain um, before as a pharmacist. What kind of dyer are you? I am relatively new to dyeing. And in case anybody hasn't tried dyeing that's listening, um, when I first, I learned about, you know, keeping track of things and really writing down details of notes so that if you want to reproduce it, you have exact uh, amounts of what you would need. I am not like that. <laughs> and so I wonder, are you a uh, careful note taker when you're dyeing? Do you reproduce colors or is it like, magic potion, which is how I feel about it. <laughs> well, the, funny you should ask. Um, when I started this, it's almost my left brain and my right brain fighting. Because <laughs> when I started this, especially when I approached a, a few potential wholesale customers, they asked for fabric cards and, and stock colors that they could order. And I really resisted that because for me, the creativity was what was fun. I, I must say I have gravitated to, oh, maybe 10 or 15, what I call stock colors, where I have developed the formulas. I am only able to use 16 dyes. And so I've had to be creative. It's not like wool dye where there are hundreds of dyes you can choose from. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been the silver lining, if you will, because it's it's made it narrows it. <laughs> so I do have some stock colors. Um, but what I really love to do is um, what I call exhausted pots. So when I do, um, you know, a first generation dye, I'll then put in a little piece of sample velvet 
uh, very small, to um, see what what is left in that pot. Mm -hmm. And it's often prettier than the original one. So then I'll put another uh, piece or two in, in that pot and, and see how it comes out. And maybe even a third generation, or I'll add a little bit of a different color if I want to accentuate what's left in that pot. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never had a problem with those exhausted pot dyes um, you know, turning bad or uh, not um, not uh, aging well. Velvet, the good thing about velvet is um, it takes the dye up really quickly, much more quickly oh. than, than wool. So I guess I can do that. Um, so that's kind of the, the schizophrenic me in terms of formulas versus uh, unique. But I'll have people who will say, gee, I bought this piece um, from you a few months ago or last year. Can, I'd like to order more. And I say, well, I'm sorry. I can try. Send me pictures. Um, but uh, most of mine are unique. Yeah. Okay. I'm not the only one. That <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'll ever die in any quantity, but... Um... But yeah, I definitely have that fight. I start out with good intentions of a notebook and a pen and my measuring spoons, but I usually lose track pretty quick. Um, so I'm <laughs> going to pull up the beautiful rug you shared uh, with me and we'll show everybody. It'll just take a second to load up here. Hopefully there we go. Okay. So tell us about this beautiful rug. Well all right. It's not really a rug. It's more a mat. Um, I'm looking at it right here in front of me, and it's probably, oh, eight inches by 10 inches. Obviously, it's uh, kind of an amorphous shape. It's not um, straight edges. The story, this is my seventh, what I call sampler. Mm. And um the, the cat's paws that you see are mainly um, my hand-dyed velvet. And uh, on sampler number one, I started by hooking different spot dyes that I had dyed and putting the pictures on Facebook to show rug hookers how the different pieces would hook up. Mm -hmm. Because it's difficult to see in a, in a piece of velvet puddled or even right. flat folded how it's going to look. So that's how I started. I just used trimmings um, from the pieces and it was pretty successful in terms of people enjoying it. Well, I finished that piece and I decided, oh, I have time. I'm just going to hook the background in um, black um, yarn. I think it was Briggs and Little black yarn. And I finished, it wasn't exactly um, a rectangle because of that, of the way that it became, it wasn't going to be a mat. And um, I said, this could go on the wall. And so um, it is, it's on the wall of, of our house. And with each subsequent one, I think I'm becoming, um, I'm expanding and becoming more adventuresome and creative. So number seven has the same orange velvet uh, as a braid. The, as is in that large um, cat's paw that also has some kind of a novelty um, mohair yarn oh, uh, in it. Yeah. Um, I've got some uh, taffeta. I've got some of the um, synthetic silk that I dye and some yarn. And I don't know if you can see, but um, I, I kind of had some maroon yarn going from one cat's paw yeah. to another, almost like a journey. And I decided... I'm not going to make, I'm going to make this amorphous. So I don't know what kind of shape you'd call it, but you can turn it any different ways and, and, and hang it. I share my dye studio with a very good friend of mine who's a painter. And she encouraged me to hang these in our studio. And she places her easel right in front of them because she said it gives her, um, ideas for color it inspires her um with color oh, uh, yeah interesting isn't it so i'm not sure what i i they're on my website so far i haven't sold any um but again as with most else that i do i just keep making them and um it's very satisfying this one 
I, I'm not sure you can see, but it doesn't have black yarn. It's bamboo stretch fabric is what I used oh. for the background. Yeah. Um, found a clothing manufacturer in Maine who was willing to send me for the price of shipping all their trimmings. Um, and some of them were black. Uh, and so I, I cut the strips um, about a half an inch and I hooked them as I would uh, with wool. Um, I don't know that I'll continue to, to do that, but again, it's another example of an alternative fabric. Mm -hmm. Well, and using waste, what otherwise would be seen as waste material potentially, um, I love that useful. part. Yeah, me too. Me too, for sure. Oh, and, it is and I love that they would be willing to do that. Um, we used to go up to BC to the wool gathering 12 different 12 years in a row, I think. And we my husband and I would drive and we would go to all the Pendleton um uh, mm. mill shops, et cetera, in, around Portland. And they um, would sell a lot of waste wool that I've um, braided, primarily braided with, but some hooking. Um, and yeah, there's a satisfying part of it, especially these days uh, yeah. when we're into the reuse category. Yeah. yeah. When we know so much is not uh, being used to make use right. of it. It's wonderful. Oh, this is lovely. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. And I was just thinking, I bet you get asked all the time, how do you cut your stretch velvet for hooking? Uh, well, working or braiding, I gather. But I know people have asked me this when I've used stretchy fabrics. They're kind of like, ha, ah, they get scared of it or don't know what to do. So do you want to explain your method uh, in right. case anybody's like, how did she do that? <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, not to promote my website, but I do have a tip page on my website that talks about that. So it's the velvethook.com. And just look, I think it's the menu. It says learn and then there's a tip. Um, so quickly, what I do is I fold it nap down. So I'm um, cutting with a rotary cutter and a healing, healing mat, <clears throat> but with the fuzzy part of the velvet right side together okay and then use a, a ruler and um trim off the edge if you need to get a, a a clean edge and then um press down quite a bit on the ruler and i find that with a rotary cutter um you don't won't get as much of the angel dust <laughs> uh that sometimes can um happen with the velvet I, for some reason some of the colors seem to have more angel dust than others. Mm -hmm. I fold it so there's a really no more than 15 inches. I think that is um, a good length. So uh, if you are using a 30 inch uh, piece, then I would fold it once um, and, and cut it that way. You'll get a clean edge. The nice thing about stretch velvet is well, the not so nice is you can't tear it, but the silver lining is it cuts cleanly, won't fray, won't shred like silk yeah. velvet. And um, that's the way that I cut it. I discourage using your rug hooking yes. cutter, but I do have some customers who, um, who swear by that. And then yeah. you can always, if you don't have all the rest of those tools, you can use a scissors, but you won't get it quite as um, uh, straight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, good to know. And I will put the link for anybody watching. It will be below my pointing below, but when it's on YouTube, there'll be a spot there with your uh, link to your website as well. If anybody's um, wants to find great, that. Great. More. And I'm always yeah. happy to answer questions um, and get people involved in, in trying new things. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Diane. Um, I want to go hook now. <laughs> I always get inspired after these <laughs> meetings to like hook. And I love your hit and miss one behind you. That is just gorgeous. Um, is that wool leftovers or what do you have going on in there? That's actually the second one I did. I started the first one during the pandemic with all my leftover noodles or worms. Yep. And I did outline it in velvet, but this, this one, and I, you can see, I'm almost done with it. Mm. I used a lot more velvet. Um, the first one is hanging 
on the wall. And this one might be, although maybe I'll try it on the floor. And I'm, I uh, don't know if you can see, but the very center, which is all that's left to do, I'm going to hook in the same cranberry velvet. Um, oh. And I think I'm going to do another one because it's just a very nice go-to mesmerizing um, thing, to, thing to hook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am into straight lines and circles like your other piece. I, I have several that I've done in the last year that are literally just straight lines and circles and I love them. They're very meditative and relaxing and yet still so effective design wise, I find just still appeal to me a lot. Um, yeah, just I think what I like to say is um, let the fabric speak. And so if you use very interesting fabrics, whether it be wool, velvet, taffeta, whatever you use, you can use that simple design and, um, and yet it, it's very, it can be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Diane. And um, I look forward to meeting you one day. I think we will next year. Um, and Matt Tigger, I hope yeah, so. I hope so too. Thanks and if, Robin. Thank you. And I'm just, here we go.